It is uh, a huge honor to be with one member, uh, a star member of our brand new profession uh, specialty, the ninth specialty, which was the um, max oral and maxillofacial radiology. So when I got out of school in 87, and uh, there was only eight, and I, I never saw this coming. I have to tell you, at 52 years old, I, um, I remember seeing the first cell phone. A patient walked in, and it was this brick with a cord to a briefcase and I said that's you know why don't you just use a phone I didn't see the cell phone coming uh, in freshman year at Creighton I know you uh practiced in Lincoln Nebraska for a while uh freshman year at Creighton in 1980 in Omaha Nebraska a friend of mine showed me a Tandy personal computer and demoed the whole thing to me and I said that's got to be the stupidest idea ever <laughs> and I have to tell you I, I didn't see oral and maxillofacial radiology coming so Shawnee, I, I'm a big fan of yours on social media. I follow you on Twitter. I love everything you do with teaching uh, radiology. I just think you're uh, you're just a dynamo. I really do. So, well, thank but, you. but let's open up to all the old guys. Why is this a new specialty? And what made you become a new specialty member of this brand new specialty? Well, I was really fortunate in the sense that when I went to dental school, I actually had three radiologists teach me. Uh, most dental schools don't have three radiologists, and one of the guys, actually, uh, Dr. Lars Hollander, he just turned 80, and he's still teaching, which is insane, in my opinion, but, you know, he's still sharp as a whip, so, I mean, that's that's awesome for him there. Uh, when I was in dental school, I just did a little research that involved me being the radiology clinic. I just had a really fun time in there where I would ask a lot of questions like, you know, what's this, what's this, what's this? And after about like two weeks or so, they turned it around on me when I was doing my research and they started quizzing me on all of the questions. And then the, my Dr. Hollander, he's, he's got some crazy, crazy stories. Like I remember one time he comes in, he looks at these radiographs, hasn't even seen the patient, hasn't seen their name, doesn't know anything about them. And he's like, he looks at them, does a little bit with the student. And then he goes off, he goes, I want to talk to your patient. Goes off to the patient and goes, do you have a history of kidney stones? And the patient's like, well, yes, I do. And I was just like, I thought it was so cool. Like the mystery aspect of learning about a patient off of just imaging without actually having the chance to meet them first. So it's like a big mystery to me. And so after he saw my interest, he's like, there's a specialty for you if you're interested. Kind of just kept nurturing it every time there was a weird case in dental school. Hey, why don't you come check this out? And so after about a year or so, I was like, I think I want to go into this and be in the education world where I get to see a lot of weird, crazy stuff and challenge myself every day. Well, that is, that is a, a beautiful story. Now, that's you, but why did the American yes. Dental Association, um, I mean, because they've been requested for, especially for implantology, which I yes. thought that would have been the next one, and then out of nowhere comes oral radiology. Well, radiology, the specialty of oral radiology actually has been around for quite some time. The academy was officially formed like back in the 40s and the 50s. And the reason I think that they finally were pushing more so in the 80s and 90s to become a specialty is the rise of 3D imaging. CT imaging was coming on the scene. It was really picking up in medicine, but people were finally starting to realize that we could use this in dentistry. And this is before cone beam CT even came to be. But they realized that with these advanced imaging, there really wasn't anybody who was trained to not only understand how the imaging works, but also understand how to interpret these images besides beyond say the pathologists who understand obviously quite a bit as well about radiology but they also have the histology aspect they focus more on because they have histopathological slides so they pushed primarily for those additional imaging but also for the teaching aspect for students to make sure the new generation of dentists coming out have a really solid radiology found foundation so that they can be ready for the next thing that's coming in dentistry it really is uh, the ultimate non-invasive surgery, isn't it? I mean, yes, it is. That is it, true. It, it is truly amazing. And I thought I had a um, the most incredible um, training in um, anatomy and physiology with Dr. Bernard Butterworth at UMKC. I mean, he was a master. And I saw my first CBCT, and I never felt so humbled in my life. I mean, I didn't know what anything was. <laughs> yeah. And I was looking at all that. And, and, and just yesterday... Dr. Glass and I were both looking in here. I'm 52. He's 56. We're both sharp guys. And we there was something in there and we were looking at that. We didn't have any idea what it was. Um, so, so tell me, so how prevalent is the CBCTs? And by the way, so, someone earlier said that the uh, CBCT really isn't even the correct name for what we're using in dentistry, that cone beam, CT, 
that that like when we buy uh, I bought a care stream but yes. that's really not even technically a CBCT is that correct in your view um, well the comb beam CT is named a comb beam CT because it all has to do with how the image is captured so in medical radiology the CT is like if you were go to hospital and get a CT a computer tomography scan it's made with radiation in the shape of a fan so you get all these different slices and they're fans of radiation that image you the cone beam ct is named because the shape of the radiation is in the shape of a cone so like a traffic cone that you'd see on the road you drive around those big orange cones that's the shape of the, the radiation comes out of the x-ray source and it's computed, computed tomography because we're using x-rays and it's going to be 3d imaging so they can compile them all together to make it a cone beam computed tomography. And currently everything in dental right now that has 3D imaging capabilities falls under cone beam um, computed tomography. But yes, there are a few machines that are not necessarily true cones of radiation, which might be why they're not truly, say, the CBCT unit under that definition. Um, is it... Um... I mean, obviously, when we say to our patients that we're going to use a CBCT, I mean, that's Latin, Greek, it makes no sense. Is it just, um, do, you, do you think it should could be just called to the patients 3D? This is our new 3D x-ray machine. Uh, we used to have 2D, because everybody understands a 2D movie at the big screen, and then you put mm -hmm. on your 3D glasses. Is calling it 3D, um, would that be appropriate? I think to simplify to patients, yes, using the term 3D is more than acceptable. Also, maybe correlating it how it relates to a hospital CT, saying that it's similar to that, but a lot less radiation dose because we're not worried about soft tissues. We're looking at just the bone and the teeth. So when you say a hospital CT, you mean CAT scan? Yes, CAT scan is the old term that has a lot of people are still familiar with for a CT, which is computed tomography. Some people, yes, will still call it a CAT scan, though. So that's where CAT scan comes from, CT, computer yes. tomography? Okay, very good. Um, you probably think I'm old, senile, and have dementia. Nope. No, and, no, uh, not at all. Okay, so how, um, so how many, there's 150,000 uh, dentists in America, uh, yes. 120,000 general dentists, 30,000 specialists. How pervasive is 3D now um, in dentistry? I mean, do you think there's 10,000 units, 20,000 units of the nine specialties? Has it entered uh, more in some specialties than other, or where, where is this hot and where is this not And as of today? Well, for starters, I think at this point, finally, and I know it sounds like it would take a little while, all the schools should at least have one comb beam CT unit, which is obviously very good. Schools were supposed to be ahead of the game, but not always, unfortunately. As for the general dental population, I don't have a number, but I can tell you a few specialties for sure, perio. And, you know, implanting, implant sites, that's been really big for cone beam CT, as well as oral surgery. Oral surgery loves to see it, especially for those mandibular third molar extractions. They want to see if it's an impacted third molar, where is it in relation to that nerve canal, so that they don't cause any permanent damage to the patient, or to even see if it's even possible to extract those teeth. As um, the, it is growing in the general dental population, a lot of those smaller fixed size cone beam CTs that just show maybe like five teeth in a quadrant. So it is growing a lot. Uh, I wish I had a, a sheer number, but anytime we talk to any of the people who sell these things, they don't want to give us numbers for obvious reasons. It's their little secret. So, and or in is. Are any of these working well enough for endodontists to where he can just say, okay, is this failing because it's a fractured root on, like, say, uh, a maxillary molar, or any, any of these machines good enough for that, in your opinion? There are machines out there that are definitely capable of it. When it comes to endo, the thing that they need to really be aware of is the voxel size, the resolution size of your scan. And so some of the machines aren't capable of actually getting down to this, but what the... AAE, the American Association of Endodontists, and my, my academy, the AAOMR, American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology, they did a joint position paper and said that for endodontic purposes, if you're looking for root canal fractures, if you're looking for missed canals, you want at least a 0.2 millimeter voxel size or resolution slice or smaller. And there are several machines now on the market that do provide that, but realistically for endo, the smallest you can go, the better. So for example, there's some out on the market that are 
0.09 millimeters, and that would be ideal for an endodontic purpose to evaluate a tooth. Do you know off the top of your head if my care stream was on that list? The care stream does have the 0 0.09, actually. Uh, it depends right on, on the number of care stream you have, like the 9,000, there's the 9,300, and I think there's, is there a 9,500 on the care stream? The 9,300, I know for a fact, does have 0 0.09 millimeters. They, um, on the care stream, just give you a heads up, they don't use millimeters, they're going to use microns. So they're going to say 90 microns instead of 0 0.09, but it's the same thing. Can you email me that paper so I can attach it on a thread after your uh, podcast in case anybody wants to read that paper? Oh yeah, I can definitely do that. You don't have to be in the secret society to read it or anything? You know, I'm pretty sure you, I'm pretty sure you don't. Actually, you know, that paper might be freely available on the aaomr.org website. They may actually have it under their joint publications, but I will definitely check out if they're first. <laughs> and then secondly, I'll look and see in the Quad O, quad o now uh, the journal to see because that, that's where it was initially published. Okay, Shawnee, this is your hour. It's not mine. Um, I'm just honored that, um, I, like I say, I've been a, a big follower of yours on uh, social media, Twitter. Uh, I, I, I think I think you're an amazing person. Um, so let, let's start with um, let's start with the nine. I, I I would assume about ninety percent of general dentists have not adopted this new technology yet. So yes. uh, so I want to start off with. Uh, um, what should a what should a dentist be out there thinking? He's practiced ten. She's practiced ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, she's got digital radiography. She has a pano machine. She has a SAF. Um, this these things are about a hundred grand, right? Um, uh, the comb beam CT. Yeah. Yeah, that's on the low end, but yes. Yeah, that's the low end. So these could be a hundred to a hundred and fifty, right? Yes. Not and um, so 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 start with the big picture of um, um, first of all your projection projection in. Um, why should, what, what should we be thinking about whether we make this big decision? Number two, um, is this bleeding edge or leading edge? I mean, is, is it a now technology or a wait and see five or 10 years? Because to be honest and with dentistry, I mean, I've been out here for 27 years and I remember when, when I got out of school in 87, they came out with a $50,000 YAG laser and like a thousand dentists jumped on it. And then about five years later, everybody said that was a, that was a yeah. bad idea. I didn't do anything with it, and now it's yeah. just a coat rack. Um, so uh, air abrasion hit the market hard, and about five thousand, ten thousand dentists bought it. And then after a year or so, everybody said, you know, that really makes a huge mess, and I'm going back to a diamond burr or carbide burr. Yeah. So so tell tell us, Shawnee, is this bleeding edge or leading edge? And if ten percent, if we assume ten percent of the dentists have it uh, now in ten years. What percent do you think will happen? Do you think it'll be 20, 30, 40? Talk about that. Okay. Um, well, first of all, the first question that anybody needs to ask, some general dentist specialist, if you're considering purchasing a comb beam CT, obviously the cost is very expensive. Um, one thing I'm not a fan of that a lot of the sales reps will do when they try to push these is they'll say, oh, well, you only need to do maybe 15 to 20 scans a month. And somebody will think, oh, okay, that's not bad, but you have to look at your current population and go, how many scans would I realistically need right now anyways? I mean, if I only need one or two a month, where am I going to find my other potentially 18 scans a month in the sense of am I going to start pushing unnecessary radiation on patients or am I going to market this out to other people? So I don't, I'm not a fan of that kind of sales marketing tactic. So definitely can ask yourself, how often am I doing scans? I mean, is this just a once a month type of thing? If so, maybe there's another place to get your imaging done. If this is something like almost every day, you're like, man, I really wish I had this in my office, then you might want to seriously consider this is something that I really need to do. I'm just, obviously as a radiologist, I'm not keen on excess radiation to people just for the purpose of because you have essentially the biggest, newest, shiny toy that's not meant to be used that way. We still need to be very, very careful with that and the radiation doses we're giving to our patients, especially any patient who is a child. So that, those are definitely questions to ask. I mean, if you are starting as a general dentist to get into implants really heavy and you know that you're going to be needing to use the comb beam CT, if you are going to say, I don't feel comfortable placing an implant without a comb beam CT, you know, maybe a comb beam CT is right for your office then. So you got to ask yourself a lot of questions of how often are you going to use this, how, you know, so that you can help with the pain, but also to make sure your population is people who actually need this information to help it to help you out. 
And when you have the cone beam CT, though, then you also need to be doing lots of up CE to stay on top of everything, not just you, your entire office, to make sure that you guys are keeping your radiation doses low and using the machine to its best functionality for your patients. You want to improve their oral health, not just get a scan to see if there's something going on. There should be a reason for it. So as for bleeding ahead, you know, this is the thing right now, or if everybody's going to wait five years, um, cone beam CTs have actually been around. Well, they were discovered back in 1997, came into the U.S. in the early 2000s. I'd say about probably between 2005 to 2008 is kind of when they really started to skyrocket on the market and when all the schools finally were starting to get their units. And at this point, I would say it's starting to become, it's not standard of care. I won't go there. That's a legal term. I'm going to stay out of that. <laughs> but it is starting to become more common day imaging for certain procedures, implants, those third molar extractions, uh, bony lesions to determine where they're at to get a biopsy or to remove those as well. I think if you wait five years, you're going to see a lot more offices have them. If we go with that assumption of, say, 10% right now, I'd, I'd say it'd probably be safe in the next 10 years to say that maybe we might double in 10 years and that 20% 20, 20 of offices will have them maybe due to improved image quality, but also because if there's more in the market, maybe the price will go down a little bit, making it a little bit more accessible for not only the patients, but also then for the office to, to buy it and then provide it to their patients. There's always going to be new imaging coming down the road. I know right now people are really looking at MRI. MRI machines cost about a million dollars, so there's just no way that's coming into dentistry as in a general dentist buying any of those anytime soon, and that'd be probably more just going off to a hospital. But for the time being, I think cone beam CT is going to keep coming in. It's not going to replace 2D imaging. We still need 2D imaging right now for our bite-wing radiographs, but it will become more standard. Who gets credit in 97 for inventing this CBCT? Uh, the very first one that came out on the market was it was in Italy, and it was the new tone. That was the very first one that ever came out on the market. It are you looks saying, like are, a CT. Are you saying Newton, like Sir Isaac Newton? No, new tome, like the word new, N-E-W, and then it's capital T-O-M. Huh. New tome, yep. They brought, us, the they brought us pizza, lasagna, and CBCT, huh? That they did, What yep. a great country. I love that country. Um, I, I want to start with uh, um, um, hi, who's the father of medicine, Hippoc Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, yes. first do no harm. Yes. Um, so talk about the, um, I, I always think back in my day, the thing they scared us about the most was exposure to the thyroid. Is thyroid still the most sensitive um, area we radiate in dentistry? And will you talk about the thyroid collar and and how um, it's it's not being really used with CBCT? Will you talk about that for a little bit? Okay, so for obviously, yes, I'm not a proponent of radiating people just to radiate them for any reason whatsoever. Thyroid, yes, is going to be the closest radiation-sensitive organ that we have. I mean, it's right just there in the neck, right next to the mandible. So for that reason, you are supposed to be very careful. The Using a thyroid collar on a cone beam CT is um, actually quite a heated debate. <laughs> I was just at my radiology meeting a few weeks ago, and you're going to find papers out there on both sides. You're going to find some papers out there that say you must put a thyroid collar on because it's going to reduce the radiation dose to the thyroid. You're going to find other papers that are going to say no thyroid collar whatsoever because if you capture even a little bit of that thyroid collar in your field of view, your scan, you're going to decrease your actual image quality. So it's kind of interesting in that sense. Uh, one way that will help is... For starters, if you have a machine that can do different sizes of scan size, choose already the smallest scan size that you need to capture the area that you're looking at instead of just, say, doing the big one and doing the entire head every time. Also, when we think about thyroid, kids, they're going to be by far the most sensitive. So if you're ever imaging a kid for any reason, that thyroid collar should always be on. They're still growing. That thyroid is just extremely sensitive. Not saying as adults you should totally ignore to still be putting the thyroid collar on. You just have to be aware, is it going to be in your field, your scan, or is it not? So if it's not going to be in your scan, throw it on. If you can somehow throw it on, but maybe say tuck the sides down right by the angle of the mandible to help so it won't be in your field of view, that's great. Any protection you can give to those organs is always a good thing. 
Huh, and I, I wonder why the thyroid would be more sensitive to radiation as opposed to the brain, the pituitary, all, all the glands in your head. I wonder why that one's more sensitive. Um, you know, the brain is still very sensitive to radiation, but it takes much higher doses to make any permanent damage to your neurons in your brain versus the thyroid needs a lower dose of radiation to cause any damage. And that's why it's just one of those sensitive organs like the gonads and blood marrow cells, all those kinds of situation. They all got kind of clumped together due to all the previous research where people were irradiated and then they saw what types of diseases, unfortunately, that they were cropping up with. Huh. I'm surprised my staff hasn't volunteered me to be studied on that disease. <laughs> and uh, so um, I, I have to tell you that um, being on dental town all day, every day, um, I do have to tell you one positive note on CBCT. You don't ever see buyer's remorse. You know, um, there was a lot of buyer's remorse with the $50,000 lasers 25 years ago or air mm -hmm. abrasions. I mean, I, I can't think of one post on Dental Tower where someone said, uh, it, to me, it's kind of like, um, um, not to be funny, but it's kind of like, once you see a CBCT, mm -hmm. it's not like you want to go back to a pano. <laughs> I mean, because, yeah. you know, not many, many panos you look at and just say, that is just too much information. But almost every CBCT, everyone looks at us like, oh my God, you could, I mean, you just got to be humble and say, that is way over my head. So are you, um, so there's, what, what is your membership now up to, especially, is it, did you, you passed 200 oral and maxillofacial board certified specialists, didn't you, or? We, um, I think, well, we board certified active, and I say active as in um, not retired, <laughs> still actively either teaching or working in private practice is actually about 140 to 150 right now. Um, actual members of our academy who may not be board certified in the sense that whether they were trained here in the U.S. or in a foreign country and just either didn't take the test for, you know, whatever reason, because there are people, we do have a few people like that. Yes, we are closer over 200 members in that sense. And that includes the uh, diplomats as well. Since, since the Italians invented it, are they exempt from being called a foreign country? Are they, no. uh, are they, are yeah. they the, are the base country now? No, they're not the base country. <laughs> but uh, then maybe they should be, uh, Anna. So, so, um, are you? Uh, I, I know you've accepted a new position at Oregon Dental School, yes. which is a um, outstanding dental school. I've been there many times. Uh, uh, in fact, one of my favorite dentists in the world in Arizona, Kelly Bradley, is a graduate from that school. Do you know Kelly Bradley? No, I do not know who that is. Yeah, she's in Bullhead City and uh, one of the sharpest uh, dentists I've ever met in my life. And she's from that school. But so, um, obviously, um, if a dentist is going to be honest, yes. uh, at least nine times out of ten, you're going to take a CBCT and see things you don't know what they are. Are you yourself, can dentists send you an email if, they're, oh, yes. if they bought a CBCT and they're like, Shawnee, what is that thing on the right? Um, are, are you doing that? And how, how does a dentist contact you? Um, I've got two methods kind of that I offer to dentists. One is kind of like a quick look type thing where a dentist could take a screenshot or make a like a JPEG image off of their imaging software and send it off to me and just give a description saying, hey, just wanted a quick look. Can you take a look at this? And so I can look at it and it's called a quick look because I don't spend too much time. I obviously just look at like maybe one or two images and I'll, you know, give a little radiographic description of it and say, Either A, here's what it is. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. Other times I may say, this is suggestive of this and you may need, you know, to look at referring out or if you're wanting to biopsy and just, you know, talk it out with a dentist. The other option is, is that I set up um, actual, I have a website where people can actually upload an entire DICOM data set to me. And then they send their referral in with me as well. And then with that, I will then download it on my side provide a detailed radiology report and then send it off to the dentist and talk with them again, answer any questions. But that way I'm not looking at just the area of question. I'm looking at everything. I mean, sinuses, we're looking at cranial skull base if it's captured, the cervical spine, airway, the neck, um, the other teeth that are on the scan that maybe somebody may have just been looking in one area and may kind of forgotten to look at everything on the scan. So it's just a nice thorough look through essentially is what the report is that I provide for offices who are interested. Yeah, and go over, go over that name. I was wondering, it's drgstoothpicks.com. So uh, that, yeah, that's my, that's my educational website. Yeah, my oh. one that I do the actual reports through is actually legacy3d.com. So just L-E-G-A-C-Y 
three D dot com. And there's um, a place where you can do a file upload. It goes through a company. I use the software called. Oh, they changed their names. What are they now? Hytel. It used to be called You Send It. It's Hytel.com. It is HIPAA compliant. So you. Hytel. H I T E L L.com. Hytel is H, like you're jumping really high. H I G H. And then tail, like a dog's tail. T A I L.com. It's okay. one of the few HIPAA compliant kind of Dropbox softwares that is in existence right now. Okay, the, the dentists in Colorado are going to think of something else besides a dog jumping high. <laughs> uh, so, and, and, then, and then, um, then tell us all about your other website, Dr. G's Toothpicks. Tell us my about Dr. that. G's, yeah, my Dr. G's Toothpicks. Um, that was something that oh, I got. Oh, Dr. G's. Oh, yes. I got that. I always wonder what the S stood for. I didn't realize it'd be possessive. <laughs> Yes, the okay. doc, it's like a Dr. G's toothpicks, and then the X is just kind of a fun play instead of a for picks for x rays, because that's, you know, I talk about radiation and do all the radiology stuff. I wanted something that was catchy, but also I was having the hardest time coming up with my Twitter handle, because Twitter has a limit of 15 characters, and my full name does not fit. So I figured I'd go with something a little more creative. That, that is an interesting name, Shawnee. You know, when I first saw your name, I assumed you're American Indian. Nope, uh, I am not. But yes, the Shawnee Indian tribe is very similar. I get that question a lot. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, but anyway, um, yeah, you're you're just you're a pioneer. I mean, heck, just to have two websites, Twitter. I mean, you're just. I mean, really, you you you're a leap ahead. I love it when you uh, send out uh, um, an X-ray and say, "What is this?" And you mm -hmm. start um, uh, seeing how everybody starts thinking. And and yep. I'm sure most people are too shy to make a guess. And uh, I would, um, it's just amazing. Okay, so we talked about that. So, so tell, well, let's go back to the general dentist. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the CBCT, um, you obviously implants, um, yes. obviously wisdom teeth, uh, yes. roots around, inferior when they're all that's a given. Yep. Um, endo for missed canals, since yes. uh, missed canals seems to be the number one cause of a of root canal failure, according to some of my ended on his friends. But mm -hmm. why did you say perio? Um, well, for perio, it's primarily for implants. And with the implants, they want to know, first of all, quantity of bone, as you know, where is the canal, especially in the mandible. But also in the maxilla, if they're going to be doing a sinus lift, they want to be able to image the entire sinus so they can know how much they can lift the sinus and pack on how much you know, bone graft material they can pack in there without occluding the sinus opening that drains into the nasal cavity. Okay, very good. And also, um, we have to talk with patients all day long. And uh, I love the internet. Um, I have to tell you honestly, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, it's a very middle class neighborhood. Uh, Twenty five percent of my patients speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very. It's not Scottsdale. It's not uh, Paradise Valley. It's 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 a very family practice. And mm -hmm. um, I have to tell you that you know three times a day in conversations at least a patient will say, "Well, I was reading on the internet, blah 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 blah." And I like it. I'd much rather have that than yes. practice in uh, 1900 when four out of five Americans couldn't read or write. I think that would have been um, yes. less fulfilling, you know, to just have some person come in there and be completely um, illiterate. But um, I love that. But how do you, could you give us dentists and hygienists and assistants some verbal language about people who just refuse x-rays because they don't want any radiation when, in mm -hmm. my, when at least in my office, we're back here thinking our head, Dude, you live in the desert. You know, if you have these views, why don't you move to Alaska or Antarctica or <laughs> Buenos Aires? I mean, you shouldn't, you know, why? how can you say that when you live in a land that's so much radiation, there's only cactus and scorpions running around? And, and, is, and, is, and is for me to even think that, is that even a correct way to think? Or is dental radiation so different than, I mean, when you walk outside for yes. six months a year in Arizona, that sun just beat you. I mean, it's like, wow. I mean, you, you, yes. you feel right. So is there any language, any, any, anything, you know, aimed at like just, you know, a sixth grade high school, not, not, not insulting the patient that they're yes. like a sixth grader, but from a non-technical point of view, some verbal conversations you can give us to talk to our patients who are refusing x-rays because of radiation. Well, and, ob and obviously a highly yes. educated mother doesn't want her baby irradiated. I mean, you got to give her credit for that. Yes. It, yeah. I mean, it's good. I think that patients are aware. It's always a good thing for patients to be aware and kind of just want to make sure that there's, you know, the do no harm thing again. 
Well, one thing to start with that every office should start with that will help is looking at the ADA and the FDA uh, prescrip prescription for um, ordering radiographs. They came out with guidelines back, and they are guidelines. It's not, you know, they're set in stone or anything. Came out with guidelines back in 2004. They updated them just in 2012. And it gives you just a really simplistic one-page table that says, based on your type of patient, is this a new patient? Is this a recall patient? Um, what type of dentition do they have? Is it mixed? Is it permanent? Is it all primary? And then you also look at the caries rate, and you can kind of follow the table across and determine how often should we, first of all, be getting radiographs on a patient. So if you were to have an adult come in your office based on this. Can, can you email me that too? So I'll attach yeah. it. Okay. Because yeah. what, what I like doing on my uh, uh, podcast is we, we always do a transcript. So if you're out there riding your bike right now or mowing your yard or riding a horse, yes. you don't have to stop to write all this down. So you'll email us that too. Yes. Yep. Okay. I can definitely email that to you. I, that's one thing that I, this is something I like to try to get out as many as people as possible. So for this, just I'll give you an example. So say you've got an adult patient coming in the door who is really adamant, no radiographs. You look at their chart. They are got great oral hygiene. They have a very low caries risk. You haven't had to really do anything in their mouth. It's pretty much they come in, they get their teeth clean. You do a look and you're like, wow, everything looks awesome. According to the guidelines, you can go anywhere from 18 months to 36 months before doing bite wing radiographs the next time the patient needs to come in. Now, I realize that's essentially going anywhere from a year and a half to three years, which is, you know, you have to take in your own personal professional judgment into this as well. But some patients maybe like to hear that they don't need it every six months, every year or so if they're keeping their mouth really clean. So maybe it could be motivation for a few people. Hey, let's take care of your teeth. Let's get these caries rate down. We'll need less radiographs. Obviously, those who have a high caries rate are going to fall more in that six to 12 month um, process where they're going to need radiographs just because they keep cropping up with new stuff every time they come in. So that's one thing to start off with. If you're already using that, that will help decrease your radiation to patients. Like you were saying though, there's radiation everywhere. We can't avoid it. It's outside. It's, you know, it's in our house. It's when we fly, just going up at a higher elevation or for you guys in Arizona, I mean, Flagstaff is pretty higher elevation too. So even just going to visit Flagstaff for a little while, or if you lived out in that area, I mean, that higher elevation, you're getting more radiation there than you would down at sea level. So you could try to explain that to them. Sometimes as people who get on the internet, one thing that might help, maybe you got to be very careful with this one is if they do a radiation dose calculator, so if they type that into, say, Google, Yahoo, whatever their search engine is, there'll be a lot of different websites out there. There's one, I think it's the nrc.gov website, has a radiation calculator where you can choose where you live. It's for those in the U.S., where you live in the U.S., how many times you travel, whether or not you have <laughs> even, say, uh, false teeth, whether you have a pacemaker, smoke detectors in the house, all those little things give off radiation. And then at the end, it gives you a pretty little pie chart of how much radiation each year you get based on the different things. And radon is the number one for everyone here in the U.S., most of our background radiation. So, I mean, those are other ways that you can kind of try to explain that radiation is everywhere. We can't control it. Um, obviously, yes, the radiation we get from the radon and all those other stuff in our house is a little different than the radiation that we get from dentistry. But again, if you're following those guidelines, that'll help keep it down, as well as making sure your technicians are trained so that you're doing less retakes. Always a good thing, too. So if they're really trained in the sense that they, you need a periapical radiograph and they can get it on that first shot instead of needing three or four, that's going to help also. Is there any um, apples to apples uh, comparisons of uh, two a set of bite wings or a full mount? So, I mean, you've, back in the day, they used to say, yes. you know, bite wings is equivalent to uh, being outside in the sun for 10 minutes. Is that a, is that a fair statement or is there anything? Um, it's, or, or is it it's, too, kind of, it's hard. It, and yeah. I say it's hard because of the sense that it kind of depends on where you live. So when I was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and this is also where it gets a little tricky. In Lincoln, Nebraska, at the dental school, we were using phosphor plate system, and we had rectangular collimation. So we didn't have a round cone. We had a rectangular-shaped cone. And so using the phosphor plates with the rectangular collimation at about 1,100 elevation, 1,100 feet above sea level, a set of four bite wing radiographs was about a half-day background radiation. So you have to look at uh, what's your image receptor. Are you using film? 
F speed, D speed, are you using digital? Are you using sensors, phosphor plates? You need to also look at then. You said bite wings equaled a half day's exposure? In Lincoln, Nebraska, for the oh. phosphor plate system yeah. with a rectangular collimation. So wow. there's like, there's kind of, it depends on your elevation and where you, where you live at. Depends on your, for your actual x-ray unit, is it a round cone, rectangular? Are you collimating it down to rectangular? And then also, like I said, are you using film? Are you using digital? And kind of your exposure time. We've obviously in the last 20 years have decreased our radiation exposures to patients immensely. But a lot of our patients, especially those who've been going to the dentist for a long time, they don't realize this and they're not going to probably comprehend that we're down from what used to be a second exposure down to a tenth of a second exposure. And they wouldn't realize that sitting in the chair. They just feel the uncomfortable apparatus kind of in their mouth and they just know that you're getting your image you need to do your work. And I want to um, go off into a completely different area, but one that really um, bothers a general dentist, and that is um, back, you know, back in the day, it seemed like so many of the materials did not show up on x-ray. So for a general dentist taking a bite wing uh, of a filling, you know, 25, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. half the time you didn't know, is that a base? Is that a liner? Is that decay? Um, are we doing as a profession a lot better where all the man-made cements and bases and liners are, are carrying something so it shows up on an x-ray? Or what, what, what is your thoughts on that? I mean, um, Most of the liners and the cements I've seen, yes, now are very radiopaque in the sense that you can tell it's something man-made. It does not look like anything. It's more radiopaque than the enamel, the bone, all that other stuff. So it's evident that this is something that a person, a human being, stuck in the mouth there is a weird thing though with the composites. Um, composites are always tricky. That you started out used to be radiolucent, and <clears throat> the, the, then they went radio opaque. And for some reason, I'm not quite sure what the manufacturers are thinking on this one. They've started making more of the composites to have a very, very similar radio opacity to enamel. So when I'm teaching the students, a lot of times, I mean, I know what the DEJ of a tooth looks like on a radiograph. I have the experience of looking at more radiographs than they do. But when they're starting off, if it's a smaller, say, occlusal restoration, they don't catch that that's actually a composite in, on the radiograph. And sometimes, because they're still new, when they look in the mouth initially, they don't also see it because they're still trying to figure out the normal anatomy of the tooth. So that's one that I'm not quite sure why they're trying to mimic. The radio I, 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 don't, I don't know why. I, it confuses the heck out of me. I mean, the, the, the main thing that confused me with... Um, Composite makers, why there's nothing in there antibacterial. I mean, I always, I always view dentistry as a biological problem. Yes. It seems like all the composite manufacturers always view it as a mechanical engineering, structural engineering problem. They, they want a, a certain material of wear and strength. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this is going to fail from an infection of recurrent decay underneath it. It's not going to break in half. That, that's not the problem. The problem is yes. antibacterial. And they always want to do wear and strength and megapascal and all that stuff. But yeah, I think that's not really confusing. Um, is it safe for you to say to dentists um, when we're not sure? Um, you know, a lot of times these composites, you see an, an MOD composite. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you see a radiolucency underneath. Um, and, but if it's if it's just fairly uniform, I mean, I, I always think of Streptococcus mutans not having any order to its growth. I just see it as like a random chaotic infection. So mm -hmm. if it looks fairly linear, is that yes. always a good rule of thumb that it's probably not? That's infection? exactly what I teach my students. Exactly. If you see a radiolucent area underneath a, a restoration, as a composite restoration especially, and it's got a nice sharp line on it, really well defined, that's going to be more of a man-made cut to the tooth. You're right. Caries, when it grows, it just goes to town. It's going to go all over. It's going to be more diffuse radiolucent area, not a nice sharp edge. They don't, the bacteria doesn't march in rows down through the tooth like that whatsoever. And also back in the day, um, I was formally taught that what we see on a bite wing is actually only 40% of the size of the lesion. 27 years later, is that still a good number, or will you talk about that? I would have to say that number actually pretty much still stands true, especially with our faster speed film, so like F-speed film versus even the digital imaging. Because we're using less radiation, the size of the carious lesion we see on a radiograph, yes, is always smaller than in the mouth, and I'd say about 40 to 50% smaller than what you're going to see. So a lot of what people are going with digital imaging is that if it's halfway through the enamel, that means that when you get in there and you go and you remove it, there's a good chance you're already touching the DEJ. 
Yeah, one thing I've done with my uh, long-term uh, hygienist, and that is whenever we would disagree, when they would say, I'd say, well, that's a, a DO on three. And she'd say, I, I put a watch. So I'd always put a, uh, a note on the chart. Mm -hmm. So when that patient, when I was doing that, as soon as I drilled into that, mm -hmm. and then I would go get the hygienist, and I'd make her sit down and mm -hmm. spoon x-ray her, and she'd go back to the x-ray and think, wow. Yeah. And, and I was trying to uh, teach that point because it's uh, – and a lot, a lot of that stuff, you have to associate the vision of the radiograph with the show touch feel of yes. drilling on that tooth. Um, yes. So we'll, what else um, did you want to talk about? Um, I, I wanted to ask you if there's, um, we, we always see advertisements for other technologies uh, for caries indication. Um, yes. And there's lots of companies. I mean, and over the years, there's been, some have been light, some have been wands, some have been yeah. dyes and stains. Yes. Is there any other, if, if I took away Renkin's radiographic machine yes. and, and took out, take out all those radiation dose, are there any other technologies that um, have your attention or you think um, are here now, um, leading edge, not bleeding edge? You know, when it comes to all the new stuff, I'm... My interest is definitely peaked, but I haven't seen enough to make me go, yeah, that's definitely what I want to say, even be telling the students about. Because a lot of times I'll be talking to the students, and they'll ask me, say, if I go off to like the ADA meeting, which I know was just last week, you couldn't make it this year, but they'll even ask me, you know, what I'll ask them, have you guys been taught about this or this and that? And so right now, I got to say, when it comes down to it, the bright light, that really is uh, the only one that I've seen that is effective. I'm still waiting for a little bit more information on the other guys that are coming out yet as to whether I'm sold on, yes, I want to be telling students or any practitioners I meet when I go off to CE courses, you know, this is an interesting thing. You definitely want to be looking into it. I, 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 um, I like the bright light on mm -hmm. flat, thin incisors, and anterior but nothing teeth. in the molars. Oh, that, that's the problem. It works for the anterior teeth. I agree. The posterior teeth, you're... They're just a little too thick there. <laughs> and, 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 in, and in my office, nine out of, nine out of ten interproximal cavities are going to be in the, on the molars and premolars. And, exactly. And, and, and by the time the problem is. And by the time you have interproximals on the anteriors, you pretty much are doing an MOD on every tooth in the mouth anyway. I mean, they got a huge uh, dietary problem. Um, so, um, so let's go back to this dentist. Um, I'm a, let's say it's a general dentist. Um, I would think 80% of the general dentists do not place implants. Um, nice. I would think 80% of the general dentists do not pull, um, pull impacted wisdom teeth. So yeah. if you were a general dentist and you did not, uh, place implants and you don't want to place implants, so there's a lot of dentists that they just say, Shawnee, um, you know, I really don't like to do the blood and gut surgery stuff. I, I yes. really don't want to place an implant. I really don't mm -hmm. want to take an impacted wisdom tooth. Um, if you, if, if you were that dentist yes. and this machine was, six figures um yes. do i need to buy that machine i mean can i be a good dentist without spending a hundred thousand dollars on a cbct if i don't place implants or pull impacted wisdom teeth can i still be a high-tech high-quality dentist i think you can but i think that you would also want to have an avenue somewhere that should you find a case where you have some pathosis that you want more information Say you see something on your 2D images, on your periapical radiograph, your pantomograph or something. You see something and you're like, I don't feel comfortable with this. This looks like there might be something more going on. You'd really want to be able to have that avenue to say, here, I'm going to refer you off to, say, if you're next to it, you're near a dental school. You know, I'm going to refer you off to the dental school to get some additional imaging because I just want to get a better look at this. And it may turn out to be it's just their normal bone pattern that's mimicking disease, which happens. Or it may turn out to be something more serious, but the point is, is that you were able to at least help them take the path necessary so that the person who then does go in there and remove it will have all the necessary information to do the best job possible, causing the least amount of harm to that patient. <clears throat> and if you got that x-ray, um, be, mm -hmm. more, be more specific on your website, because I know a lot of dentists, um, they're just not that, a lot of them, especially my age, are not that tech savvy. How difficult is it to upload one of these to your website? I mean, what all is involved? Um, well, I mean, are you gonna are you gonna download that X ray on your machine to like a, uh, a like a thumb drive, and then uh, you know how how's he gonna get that how's he gonna get that information out of his CBCT mm -hmm. and into the internet 
into your okay. website? So what they do is, first of all, on the Combeam CT, there's usually, now each machine and software is a little different, but there's usually two methods you can export the data. One is to export it and burn it with a viewer, which is something that, say, if you're sending it off to another office to be viewed at or the patient wanted a copy of it. Another is to export it in DICOM, which is D-I-C-O-M format. And so what you would do is you would actually export it in DICOM format, maybe onto your desktop of that computer or into a folder probably is actually what I'd recommend because if you do multi-file, there'll be like anywhere from 300 to 500 files. So you put a file folder with that patient's name. And then for on the website, the legacy3d.com, you go down on the front page to the file transfer and you click there and then you actually can just grab that folder and drag it right over to the box when that page opens. And then in your email, you put your email in and you put any information you want to specifically be looked at on that report in your the subject area and down in the actual area of the email and then you just hit send. It will upload, just give you a heads up, those are big files. It may take anywhere from five to 10 minutes depending on your internet speed and how fast your computer is. But then that's really it. It's really a dr click and a drag, fill out your information and then hit submit. Um. Yeah, I, I notice everybody talks about the DICOM file. I, I didn't hear, yes. get the name of the first file, but I, the second one, uh, yes. the DICOM, that seems to be what everyone... That well, seems... di DICOM is actually something that medicine came up with. I can't remember when they did, but the problem was is that all of the companies were coming up with their own things. So like CareStream would have had CareStream only type images instead of say a JPEG. And so Serona would have Serona only images and that only could be read by Serona. So DICOM was created so that any hospital at all, pretty much in the world, it's not just the US, in the world can transfer their images and they can be viewed at that hospital. Dentistry uh, with Combeam CT, we were a little slow to start off. Everybody had these capabilities, but they're finally starting to all have now the DICOM format because this is what we should be using because it has all the patient information, everything like that. So you must be very careful, obviously HIPAA-wise, when you submit these images anywhere. But it's just the only way to ensure the image is seen initially as how you were seeing it too. Yeah, we, we see that in a CV in a CAD CAM too, where mm -hmm. you know there's closed proprietary systems and there's yes. open formats, and uh, laboratories have to deal with that a lot. Um, exactly. Um, so um, back to the um, back to the I forgot I had a. Uh, Oh, I know what I was going to ask. And what, what, what is the turnaround time? Like if I have a patient, I get that CVCT, I upload yes. it to you, and I say, will you look at this? What kind of turnaround time is he looking at? Um, is that a week to 10 days? Is that 48 I hours? Is that a month? Um, five days, five at the end. I say five business days, but it all kind of depends on how many other cases I have. I try to realistically do it within one to two business days is what I'm shooting for. Obviously, the more cases I get, it's going to be a little bit more difficult <laughs> to get that quicker turnaround, but I, I especially want to. But also, if a dentist is saying this is urgent, if they were to mark that and say, urgent, can you please get this back to me as soon as possible, they might help them jump the pile so that I could try to make sure I get that one out maybe within more like a one-day turnaround. Wouldn't it be easier if you just made all your students read them for extra credit? <laughs> <laughs> if only, except for they don't know what the hell they're looking at. That's the problem. So I, I want to also say that um, being a, being an older guy, that um, that you'd be surprised. You know, specialists d would do anything to meet a general dentist because um, number one, they they they're B to B specialists make their money from uh, mostly from uh, other dentists. Um, yes. Um, as opposed to dentists are more B2C, business to consumer. So we, dentists tend to market uh, to patients and dentists tend to market to de uh, to other dentists, B2B. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 now granted I'm in a very huge city, but I don't know a single oral surgeon uh, mm -hmm. that if you said, can my assistant take over my patient Shawnee and take a CBCT, would you mind? Um, they, they, everyone I know is like, absolutely. And I'm a general dentist yes. and I have, um, probably about five general dentist friends mm -hmm. who just pop in unannounced every once in a while because I have an open door policy. It's like, yeah, cause I actually feel better. I mean, if you spend a hundred thousand dollars on a care stream machine, yes. you want it used a lot. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want the thing gathering dust. So, and, and it's a great social thing. I've always thought the dentists who have the biggest social networks of other dentists always seem to be the happiest 
most motivated, and the people who um, are the most withdrawn and the most introvert and the most keep all their problems inside usually are the ones that um, someday they just you know explode into thin air and, and turn turn big flash. So I, I think um, I think if you're not sure if you need one of these things, start start talking to a specialist. It's fun. It's social. Uh, a lot of times they turn into your biking partners, mm-hmm. your jogging partners, swimming mm-hmm. partners. I mean, uh, it's amazing how many uh, orthodontists are at a lifetime fitness and all that stuff. It's fun time. Um, so I've only got you for 10 more minutes. Um, what, 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 what should we be talking about that I'm not even smart enough to ask you? Oh, geez. Let's see. I mean, I, I go over lots and lots of fun stuff. Uh, there's lots of new stuff that is coming out there on the market that's obviously controversial. Um, I'm going to be actually doing a CE course, let's see, in just a few weeks about the bite wing modality on pantomograph or panoramic machines. And just, it's a short and sweet CE. They do a series of like just 30 minute talks and the audience gets a chance to kind of learn what's the hot topic essentially. And I know that's especially a hot topic right now because of insurance reimbursement. (laughs) Because offices have been buying these machines thinking this is awesome. I don't have to do bite wing radiographs anymore. I'll just use this one machine. I'll get my my pantomograph or panoramic radiograph. And then I'll also just click the bite wing feature and I'll get my bite wing radiographs. But that's an extra oral image. And according to the ADA codes, bite wing radiographs are intraoral images. So they're submitting them to insurance and insurance is saying, no, we're not going to pay these. These are not bite wing radiographs. These actually have to be coded as an extra oral radiograph and they may not actually have much of a reimbursement, if any reimbursement for an additional extra oral image. So that's one, one thing that's kind of hot topic right now that I know in California has recently been an issue for several people. Shawnee, how close are we before, you know, um, when I heard the, um, uh, back in 2004 when Google was going public, uh, Sarge Brennan and Larry Page, they were talking about their, their true passion was not search, that was a, a business model, their true search, their true passion was artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. How close are we to that leap where the CBCT or the radiograph mm-hmm. runs through it and says there's a cavity, uh, enough areas demineralized on the mesial of three that that is a lesion. How close are we to that? Is that 10 years out, 20 years out? Is that Star Wars stuff or is that around the corner? Um, well, it's a mixture of right around the corner for some patients. I have to emphasize for some patients, but for other patients, I think we'd probably be another 10, 20 years. And it all comes down to existing restorations in a patient's mouth. You have a patient who's got any existing restorations. They've got amalgams. They've got even composites. They've had endodontic treatment. They have, you know, got a percha hanging out there. Those all cause artifacts. They cause streaking artifacts. And so because of that, we cannot really see the interproximal of teeth very well for small lesions. So you still have to rely on bite wing radiographs. They're going to be the bread and butter still for those patients. You have a patient, no restorations, whatever, which we are starting to get more of those patients, but there's still more patients though that are going to have existing restorations. So a patient has no restorations whatsoever. Yes, sometimes, I'm not going to say all the time, but sometimes on a comb CT, you can catch those lesions in the enamel. But if we're still, then that's where the ones that it's just around the corner for. But it's a catch of how many patients do you have that have zero existing restorations that would qualify. And at that point then, why are you doing a cone beam CT, which is so much more radiation than, say, bite wing radiographs? You know, there'd, probably, there'd have to be some other reason why you were doing the cone beam CT because of the excess radiation still right now. So some people, yes. Other ways, we got about 10, 20 years, and they can figure out how to get rid of that streak artifact, which is a tricky, tricky thing to do. So we're, we're, we're getting there, and they're trying, but we're not there yet. I want to ask you another thing that's really flying around the Internet and um, bothering a lot of dentists over a lot of cities and that is um you know there there's just there's a website that just keeps getting hit about what what do 99 percent of all cancer patients have in common uh, they've had a root canal <laughs> and it shows all these pictures about how there's still residual infection at the end of course when you talk to endodontists they're going to say, well, you have your body interfaces bacterial in your mouth and your sinuses and your eyes, your ears, downstairs, mm-hmm. all, all these places. Um, but I want to ask you specifically, um, when a dentist sees uh, something at um, a periapical of a tooth, 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's had a root canal. It was 5, yes. 10, 20 years ago. Yes. The tooth's completely asymptomatic. Yes. But you see a little periapical radiolucency. Does that, does that always say, that's a failed root canal. You need to retreat that, apicoidectomy, retrofill. Or could that be a radiographic lesion, scar tissue, uh, something else? Will you talk about that? Um, it, it could be exactly the kind of options you said. It could be a failing root canal, which may still be asymptomatic because a lot of times even normal teeth that haven't been endodontically treated may have that radiolucent area at the apex and are still asymptomatic. They just haven't flared up. There is also, the, like you said, the fibrous scar. It just had fibrous healing instead of bone healing. Uh, the difference is really going to be on a fibrous scar. You should be able to see a pretty well-defined kind of corticated radiopaque border around it indicating that it hasn't changed. And also, if you've been following it over time at all with, say, 2D imaging, you'll see the size stays exactly the same. If it's a failing endo and there's actually some bad stuff down in there, it's going to keep growing over time. So it's one of those things, I guess, you know, they're asymptomatic and you're, you don't see nothing. You say you had an endodontist just right next door. You, they take a look. They're not too concerned about it. They may say, well, when they come back in six months, we'll do another periapical radiograph or something and we will evaluate has it changed? Has it not changed? If the patient stays completely asymptomatic at that time, those are always, I agree, a little on the more tricky side. Watching it to see if it grows versus also looking at just the edge of it, that radiolucent area. So I only got you for two more minutes. Is there any any other uh, any other areas you want to hit that I uh, didn't ask? Uh, not that I can think of, other than you know, like you mentioned with the website, I'm always looking to see what other people, what other radiology topics people want me to post on. It's obviously primarily for my students, but it has caught on, and I have a lot of people around the world now who are following my website. I do my little find the carries and locate the object for image shift practice for anybody out there, students and dentists alike, dental professionals. So if I would just say, if anybody's got any fun topics on radiology or topic on radiology they want me to hit on. You know, shoot me a message on my website, the Dr. G's Toothpicks, or on Twitter. You know, that's the same Dr. G's Toothpicks, and let me know, and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Well, I, I think the number one question every dentist in America has for you is that now that you've left Nebraska, are you still going to be a patriotic Big Red football fan, or are you going <laughs> to throw them under the bus for some low-life Oregon team? <laughs> if I'm going to pick any college football team, I'm going to pick where I went to dental school, and that's going to be UW, and that's the Huskies. <laughs> oh, right on, right on. <laughs> Well, hey, uh, I love your energy, love your karma. I think you're absolutely uh, brilliant, genius, uh, oh, creative. You. Your your site's amazing. Uh, if you're a dentist, you haven't checked it out, uh, not only do you need to check it out, uh, you need to check it out with your hygienist and dental assistants. And then, in fact, I, I do have you technically for one more minute, so I want to ask you I want to ask you one question. Um, I, I have this argument with dentists all the time. I, I believe when the hygienist read you know looks at the x-ray and talks Mm -hmm. to the patient because you know a lot of times they might think well the the dentist is rich and has a nice car and lives in a big house he owns his place but the hygienist i mean no 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 one thinks their hygienist is on commission or gets paid a dollar for every cavity she finds so they they, and they're in there for an hour Mm -hmm. and i i when i'm in the other room doing something cemented crown and someone asks my dental assistant a question like well will you show me that or what is Mm -hmm. that I, I, some dentists say you absolutely cannot answer that question. You say, we got to wait for the doctor. And for 27 years, I've always said, you talk to them like they're, they're your mother, your brother, your best friend. What, what do you think about hygienists and uh, hygienists in particular um, talking about radiographs in front of patients? Um, I think that they can definitely say what they're seeing on the radiograph, but they do want to also maybe phrase, hey, well, I see something here that may look a little concerning, but we're going to ask the doctor when he comes in just to get his or her final opinion. And that comes, the reason you have to, they might want to put that little disclaimer in is only because of the legal issue. But legally I, speaking, yeah, and I, I know, I know what you're saying. Legally speaking, that some dentists are a little more like, no, they can't touch it. So, you know, but they can go through and they can say, you know, I just don't like how this looks. Let's just really work on your, you know, oral hygiene instructions right now. And then when the dentist comes in, we'll see whether or not they agree or not. And, you know, just ask questions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's okay. Just maybe not go too far because you want to make sure they don't accidentally say something that may freak out the patient. That's the catch. And on that note, I just want to remind all hygienists that I've never met a hygienist serving time in jail for reading an (laughs) x-ray. Yes, that is true. Hey, Shawnee, you're an amazing person. (laughs) Thank you for giving everyone an hour of your time and your life. And uh, it was amazing. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. Go Big Red. (laughs) 